Welcome back to Making the Case. We turn now to the city of Atlanta, where two law enforcement officers are now facing murder charges for their role in the 2016 shooting of Jamarian Robinson. A medical examiner's report showed that Robinson was shot at least 60 times, yes, 60 times by police after officers entered his girlfriend's apartment during an attempted arrest. In addition to felony murder, ex-officers Eric Heinz and Christopher Hutchins are also facing charges of aggravated assault, burglary, and counts of making false statements. Cell phone video taken from outside the apartment captured the attempted arrest and the nearly three minutes of gunfire that followed. We're going to play a portion of that video for you now. I need to warn you, this may be hard to watch. Don't give me shot. He's shooting out with them folks. I hit him off over here. You hit me gunshots? Oh my God. I want to welcome back Joel Griggs, a criminal defense attorney and president of the Atlanta chapter of the NAACP to discuss this. Gerald, thanks for being with us. Well, that video, Gerald, first of all, I just got to tell you, uh, seeing these videos all the time is, is always so disturbing. Um, we heard uh, the words, two cops charged with felony murder. That's what we're saying, right? It sounds like a big deal. Now, I know that you actually have close ties to the family. So I want to start with your reaction to the indictments. My reaction is a long time coming. It's five years of fighting by Monteria Robinson and her family uh, with the assistance of many activists in the Atlanta area got us to this point. Uh, the previous prosecutor would not present this case to a grand jury and now the current prosecutor has presented it. But it took a long time for this story uh, to continue to be pushed forward by uh, Jamarian's mother. She believes that this case is a modern day Emmett Till. Uh, he was actually shot uh, 76 times. Uh, one uh, officer actually stood over him and shot down to his body. She hired her own forensic examiner that proved that point. So it took a while to get to this point, uh, but she was very uh, happy that we are now going to see a trial in this case. And so we, we are uh, happy to be standing with her in this case. 76 times. Thanks for making that correction. That's, that's outrageous. Um, and you actually call what the cops did, quote, nothing more than an execution. Describe what you think went on in that apartment in the moments before and after police started shooting. Well, the police were looking for an individual who a few days earlier had pointed a weapon at law enforcement. It turned out to not be Jamarian. Jamarian was at his girlfriend's house. Uh, the police knocked on the door. Uh, they entered the house. They just started firing. And, and of course, Jamarian uh, was upstairs was down on the ground. He was shot through his hands, uh, through his body, through his groin. A flashbang was thrown on him. Uh, and I can only imagine the, the horrific nature of how he died. I got to walk through that house the day after it happened. It looked like a modern execution had taken place. There was blood splatter everywhere. And, and so when we talk about these type of cases, this particular case is one of the most troubling I've ever seen. And so I think that, you know, the, the video cam footage does not even do it justice. You'd have to actually go through that scene to see the carnage that was left and, and uh, what happened to Jamarian. Wow, I can't even imagine what that must have looked like, Gerald. And, and judging from the video, it seemed like the police, were they anticipating the need to use force at the apartment? Because you see the group of officers and it looks like they're in full tactical gear and they surround his door immediately before the shooting starts. That's what it looks like. You can clarify that for me. Um, but why were the police called out to the apartment in the first place? Well, they were called out again because there was an allegation that a person associated with that apartment had pointed a weapon at law enforcement a few days earlier. So they called out the federal task force and the federal task force are law enforcement officers from around the metro Atlanta area that work on behalf of the U.S. Marshals. And so that's one of the reasons why it, was such, it took such a long time to get to this point is because there were so many layers of law enforcement that were acting as a buffer. Further, they did not have body cams because at that point, the federal task force did not allow body cams. And so they were prepared for an armed suspect. They entered in a tactical maneuver. That's why they were in full uh, armor gear and they were going in the way they were going in with 
automatic machine guns, but that was totally unnecessary to be at the wrong house and to treat this individual the way they did. And I think that's one of the reasons why you saw this indictment and you see these two police officers being held accountable. Yeah, still, though, it took so long. So the police say that they started firing only after being shot at by Mr. Robinson. So what do you think of that? What do you make of that? And I also want to mention, this is a good time to mention, that we reached out to the U.S. Marshals and Clayton County Police for comment on Tuesday's indictment. But as of now, we have not heard anything back from either. Well, I believe what the evidence would show in this case by what I've read in the indictment and what I know about this particular case, there are some inconsistencies in the statements of these police officers. That's why they're charged uh, with false statements. And so we know what the police said. We also know that a grand jury returned an indictment for felony murder. So there has to be some inconsistencies between the police report and what actually happened. Just like what we saw in George Floyd in the very beginning, they had a narrative that went out that turned out to be false. Uh, so I believe, uh, based on our investigation, uh, that Jamarian Robinson did not pose a threat necessitating him being shot 76 times, 110 rounds being uh, fired into the apartment complex, into that apartment. So I, I think that it's better to wait for the evidence to come out, but based on the indictment, uh, a grand jury found that there was probable cause to not believe the, the police officer's narratives. And Gerald, you were saying a little bit earlier, you were talking about the body cam. Um, at the time, federal policies didn't allow U.S. Marshals or local police officers assisting them to wear body cameras. So we have no body cam footage of the shooting, right? And do you think, though, if they were wearing body cameras, things would have turned out differently? I think that if they were wearing body cameras, we would know what actually happened precisely. I don't think things would have turned out differently in this particular case because you know, they had pre pre-established what they were going to do, how much force they were going to use. And, and unfortunately, it, it led to the loss of life of Mr. Robinson. But because of Mr. Robinson's case and another case, Jimmy Atchison's case, which also involved the federal task force, now they are mandated to wear body cams. And so I think moving forward, you will have more transparency. But in this particular case, I don't think body cams would have stopped uh, 110 shots into an apartment and 76 shots going into Mr. Robinson's body. And so I think that moving forward, this case has changed the minds of a lot of people, especially in the Atlanta area, uh, that you can get justice, you can get an indictment, but it may take a while. But hopefully this case will be a seminal case that no other case has to take five years to get to this point. Yeah, I agree. I can't even believe that it has taken so long. Um, the Robinson family, they've been waiting for this moment for a long time. Like we said, that shooting happened almost six years ago. Uh, we want to show them outside the courthouse moments after they heard the news. Oh! Yes! Oh! We just got the indictment, y'all. We, yes! we just Thank decided you. to indict the officer yes! that killed yes! Mario Robinson. Yes! 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 Oh my God. Yeah. Gerald, have you spoken with them since Tuesday's ruling? Yes, I have. And what you have to understand is that Monteria Robinson and her family have literally been carrying around pictures and, and signs and, and posters of her son's charred, destroyed body for the very purpose of getting justice. And so that emotion that you saw was the release of, of a lot of pressure, but she also said that this is not the end, this is just the beginning. She wants justice for Jamarian. She wants to hold each and every police officer accountable that had anything to do with shooting her son. And she wants this to go out to the entire nation uh, that the mothers uh, who have suffered losses uh, of their children should get justice. And so that's why you saw that emotion uh, with the activists that have been with her from the very beginning. Oh, these people are so, so strong. It's good to see you, criminal defense attorney and president of the Atlanta chapter of the NAACP. Gerald Griggs, appreciate you being with us here tonight.